Um, so as we transition into session one, um, and we can move to the next slide, uh, as we learned from our, our keynotes, uh, stigma remains a pervasive barrier to accessing and receiving quality treatment and care. And I am now pleased to introduce an expert panel who will discuss evidence-based strategies, initiatives, and other cr critical opportunities to reduce stigma towards opioid use disorder across the health system and beyond. The session will be moderated by Dr. Kelly Clark, who is the immediate past president of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And joining Dr. Clark are Dr. Colleen Berry, who is chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Margaret Jarvis, who is chief of addiction services for Geisinger Addiction Medicine and the Geisinger Neuroscience Institute. Mr. Matthew Stefanko, who is director of the National Stigma Initiative at Shatterproof, and Ms. Joy Rucker, who is executive director of the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance. Their full biographies are available on the event website for you to access. And please note that we will be taking questions from the webinar audience during the last 10 minutes of the session. Please use the comment box on your screen to answer a, to enter a question. Uh, we'll get to it later. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Clark to get us started. Thank you. Well, thank you, Liz. I appreciate uh, the introductions and you've done a wonderful job of, of uh, talking through the terrific panel that we have for you. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the Shatterproof Ambassadors that just spoke uh, uh, for making this really personal and, and bringing this into our panel. So uh, we are going to listen to everyone uh, give a presentation and then we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. So just to start off, I'd like to uh, hand things over to Matthew Stefanko, who's the director for the National Stigma Initiative at Shatterproof. We're actually going to begin with Dr. Barry. We switched up the order last minute because we have to keep things interesting. Um, okay. But Dr. Barry, we'll start with you. Thank you. Great. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And I want to echo um, Dr. Clark's uh, um, thanks to Marcy and Megan for their willingness to uh, tell their stories and underscore why this topic is so very important for us to be talking about today. Um, next slide, please. So um, the way I conceptualize stigma, and this came out in our last uh, presentations, is based on this conceptual framework by uh, Felon and Link, which includes labeling and stereotyping, but it also includes separation, status loss, power differential, and of course, discrimination. Next slide. And stigma matters um, on multiple levels, on the individual level, because as we heard, it can lead to riskier use and it can lead to profound social isolation. But it also matters on the uh, health provider and health systems level, because again, as we heard, it can lead to much poorer quality of care and an underinvestment in the training and treatment structure, infrastructure that we need as a society. Finally, on a societal level, social stigma translates, we see from the evidence base, into discrimination in jobs, in housing, in insurance coverage, neighborhood resistance to offering services, lower support for policies that are public health oriented, and greater support for punitive policies that are grounded in shame and punishment. Next slide. And we measure stigma as, as a research community in a variety of ways, including social distance measures that tell us that Americans are unwilling to have people with substance use disorders, for example, marry into their families at incredibly high levels or work closely with them on, a jo on, on jobs. Next slide. In terms of individual blame, uh, views related to, toward people who are um, addicted to opioids, for example, being to blame themselves for the problem, um, and um, this, this uh, notion of lack of self-discipline, which contradicts what we know scientifically related to um, the role of addiction as a chronic uh, medical condition. Next slide, please. And 
lead to these um, real information gaps. For example, in this study, uh, we see that basically half of the American public believes that there is no treatment, for example, for opiate addiction that is effective over the long term in the face of what we in the scientific know, community know is a, a, a strong evidence base supporting uh, medications that are gold standard and life-saving. Next slide. And we see that the kind of attitudes that Megan described um, are not uncommon. Primary care physicians and these same kinds of studies have been done with other health professionals are quite similar in certain cases, even more stigmatizing than those of the general public. Next slide. And these attitudes include what are um, known as uh, NIMBY measures, attitudes, again, among MDs as well as other health professionals. Next, next slide. And the news media, um, unfortunately, reinforces these stigmatized views. This is um, just one example of a study that was done over a 10-year period on uh, stories related to the opiate crisis, showing that about half of all news stories used at least one stigmatizing term. Next slide. So what can we do? Uh, next slide, please. So I think the main takeaway from my presentation is the evidence base for how to combat stigma is profoundly lacking. We know very little about how scientifically, how to reduce stigma toward people with addiction, how to reduce stigma toward medications to treat addiction, and how well evidence from other stigma, stigmatized conditions apply to fighting addiction stigma. And I think in other areas of science, we dig in there and we use uh, randomized control trials and other strong research methods, whereas in the area of thinking about how through communication and other strategies we can grapple with uh, stigma, we tend to go with intuition and that's um, dead wrong if we want to really be able to turn the tide with regard to stigma. Next slide. So that was the motivation for this recent uh, piece that I wrote with a colleague of mine uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it was a call to build a evidence base in stigma reduction to combat the addiction crisis. And in that piece that came out in the beginning of April, we highlighted a few principles that we do know based on the limited existing research that is available, but really underscored the need the critical and urgent need to build this evidence base immediately. Um, based on what we know to date, there are four real principles that come out. Number one, use of person-centered language is essential for stigma reduction uh, in all settings. Number two, emphasizing solutions appear to appears to reduce stigma. Number three, Use of sympathetic narratives, that is stories that humanize people with addiction, may reduce stigma, but there's, there's some um, cautionary tales in the literature, and the devil is in the details in terms of how this is done, and whether it's done in a way that doesn't reinforce the role of the individual and individual blame. And number four, that stigma reduction messages should emphasize, um, connected to the point I just made, societal rather than individual causes of addiction. Next slide. So we have a number of different um, resources to use for person-centered language, including a really helpful a memo that came out in 2017 from the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and for the Associated Press, a style guide in 2017 related to use of person-centered language in the news media. Next slide. In terms of emphasizing solutions, this has been shown in a variety of different studies, and we're increasingly seeing a orientation towards solution messaging, including in the title of this recent consensus study that was done by the National Academies, emphasizing the role of medications in saving lives. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to talk in depth about sympathetic narratives, except to reinforce the point I just made a minute ago, which is narrative and stories like the ones we have just heard can be powerful in particular and combined with uh, factual information. And you 
can see here in this study a threefold increase on the part of the American public and willingness to um, be supportive of policies related to naloxone distribution to friends and family members. Um, but there is the potential for, for narratives to reinforce individual claims. So, so these um, kinds of uh, efforts need to be done with evaluations tied to them to make sure there aren't unintended consequences. Uh, final slide, please. And emphasizing societal versus individual causes is crucial. Just one quick example of this um, fourth takeaway from our New England Journal of Medicine perspective. Um, we found in one study a 10% reduction in public support for punitive policies requiring providers to report pregnant women who have been misusing opioids to state authorities in an experiment where we really um, emphasized and drew out the barriers that these women face to accessing treatment. So um, making it clear um, that there is a broader societal role and this is not just an individual problem. That's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen. We appreciate uh, your perspective and the information uh, uh, that you've uh, gathered and put out there through the New England Journal. One of the things that I'm personally very happy to be uh, moderating this session, given sort of an MD MBA approach, is that um, you know, what we have in this session really is um, a Colleen is talking through the scientific evidence in a, in a large evaluation of the evidence base. Uh, Dr. Jarvis, next Margaret, will be talking through uh, scientific data from the health system in which she works and studies that she has done. Um, and then we'll be hearing really, Matthew, uh, well, while we may have less from a scientific evidence base, we have good models for dealing with this from a business case. Um, and I think uh, Matthew will be talking through uh, how, how this has occurred using, um, using parallels to other kind of stigmatizing disease states in the past. A and then uh, Joy will be talking through uh, really from the, 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 the person with lived experience, uh, you know, people on the ground, uh, how they're dealing with uh, stigma and what they face in, in harm reduction uh, uh, areas. So really pleased to have such a, a diverse view that really gives us a, a three-dimensional sense of what we're dealing with with stigma. And with that, I will uh, hand this over to uh, Dr. Margaret Jarvis. Thank you, Dr. Clark. And thank you, Dr. Barry. There's a lot of what you presented that we saw in the study done at Geisinger um, actually uh, several years ago now. Um, so next slide, please. I'm going to move through these fairly quickly because they're very meaty slides and it's a fairly dense project. If there is anybody who might be interested in a complete set of the slides, I'll be happy to get that to you. But I think I can get through some of the highlights of this um, and as I said, much of what I'm going to tell you that we saw in our experience at Geisinger is exactly what Dr. Barry has seen in the literature. <clears throat> so we undertook a, a, a project to understand our own staff and their um, bias towards people with substance use disorders. This took place in the waning hours of 2017. There were almost 1,200 people who were queried. They are all healthcare professionals and um, a, a little over a thousand of them responded. Next slide, please. So the, the questions had to do with what qualities of these people might contribute to their likelihood to blame help or stigmatize patients with substance use disorders. Next slide, please. And as you would expect, um, and very much along the intuitive uh, realm that Dr. Barry said we probably shouldn't rely on, but it's what we got sometimes. Um, what you would expect is that we saw that as we see increasing knowledge about substance use disorder, increasing familiarity of, of, about the personal statements and personal stories, and improved adherence to best practices, 
you started to see um, less stigmatization. And there were some very curious findings that people within our system, within the Geisinger system in Pennsylvania, would typically either have very high familiarity with uh, persons with substance use disorders or very low. And the familiarity was uh, measured in ways that might have had to do on the low end of intensity with people who had seen movies or read stories about folks with um, addictive disorders versus perhaps having had people in their family or friends who had been affected by the disease or had had actual personal experience in treating folks with the disease. Next slide, please. So there is this bimodal distribution of um, folks in our healthcare system who either acknowledged that they had never seen anything that had to do with an, a, a story about somebody with a substance use disorder versus folks who had seen a great deal of it. And that's, it's just a curious finding that among our staff, we'd see the, this distribution and it, I don't have an answer to what that means, but it's curious. Next slide, please. The other thing that we saw, and again, you might intuitively expect this, is that many of our um, staff and uh, many of our staff would not be familiar with or commonly make use of what were, are and were best practices for the treatment of opioid use disorder um, or to have any idea how to help somebody get to treatment. Next slide, please. This is the staff who responded. So a large number of nurses and clinical support staff, some physicians and a number of advanced practice um, providers, evenly distributed amongst age groups and primarily um, female as opposed to male. Next slide, please. Knowledge was of the disease was um, tested with Likert scales uh, against statements of uh, treatment around or physiology around opioid use disorder. Next slide. Familiarity, as I said before, had to do with any sort of familiarity, whether that was knowing somebody personally, having a personal history with a substance use disorder, versus even having seen a television show. Next slide. Stigmatization, again, had to do with, uh, was measured with Likert scales around statements about um, stigma and blame. Next slide, please. And then best practices had, uh, was measured using a Likert scale and looking at things that were very clearly best practices at the time in 19, excuse me, 2017, um, it's just revealing my age, um, and th which still are best practices. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. And we saw that as knowledge and familiarity and best practice scores increased, the likelihood to blame decreased. Next slide, please. As familiarity increased it, the likelihood to help increased. Next slide. Um, an interesting finding was that uh, folks who have, are advanced practitioners, so nurse practitioners, physician assistants, were less likely to stigmatize patients with substance use disorders than anybody else. Next slide, please. Women were less likely to blame or stigmatize patients with substance use disorders than men, even after accounting for everything else. Next slide, please. 
Um, next slide, please. That's essentially the same. Next slide, please. Another significant finding was that the overwhelming majority of people who were queried with this survey did not know much about substance use disorder at all. Next slide, please. And those who were in a position to be able to affect treatment for patients with substance use disorders did not adhere to best practices. These two last slides suggest that there is some very simple educational work to be done that though it certainly wouldn't go all the way to addressing stigma, would go some way to helping and probably would be pretty easy to achieve. Next slide, please. That's the end of my presentation, and I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone else. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, very interesting information, particularly that last slide or two. I'm sure we'll have some uh, discussion about the implications of that a bit later. Uh, next, we'll hear from Math uh, Matthew Stefanko uh, from Shatterproof talking about uh, sort of a, a parallel and a business uh, approach uh, to, to handling stigma. So Matthew? Great, thank you. Uh, really excited to be talking about this, uh, this topic today and wanted to thank the National Academy of Medicine for creating the forum and also for our ambassadors for, for you know, sharing their stories, which I think will parallel really well with a lot of what we've found. Um, and, and I like the way that Dr. Clark really framed this up. I mean, this is certainly, um, uh, more of a business-oriented approach, but deeply rooted in a lot of the academ academia that's already out there and, and a deep recognition that moving forward, there's a lot more um, uh, academia and, and knowledge that needs to be added to this space to, to truly create a, a change. Next slide. So I'll just touch on this briefly because I know others will be speaking on it today, but we're already hearing from many of our partners that COVID-19 it is exacerbating many of the impacts that they're seeing from the epidemic um, with folks with OUD being especially vulnerable and, and, and knowing what we know about how substance use and, and deaths of despair um, increase due to economic trauma and, and stress and these sorts of drivers that uh, we think it's especially important now more than ever that we're thinking about and, and dealing with and addressing the stigma around uh, OUD. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So when we started looking very broadly at, at the epidemic and, and the key drivers of it, we tried to boil it down to, to roughly nine. And, and when we looked at those in, in, in sort of a very broad sense, we realized that a majority, in fact, seven of the nine were, were heavily or partially or entirely driven by stigma, whether that be individuals not uh, seeking help, um, insufficient treatment capacity uh, with providers either being unwilling or unable, to help and, and things like the over-criminalization of, of those with, with SUD or OUD. Next slide. Despite this though, we're not seeing the same level of national, well-funded, evidence-based coordination that we're seeing across many of the other responses to the opioid epidemic when it comes to stigma. There are certainly amazing partners, and you'll hear about some of those today, who are doing work in, in localized environments, but the same sort of evidence-based, the national level of attention that we're seeing in other places, whether it be naloxone distribution or treatment access, you're not seeing that same level of attention when it comes to stigma. Next slide. Next slide. So because of that, we approached McKinsey and Company and the Public Good Projects, a leading health communications nonprofit to really try to understand what other movements had done successfully and really try to incorporate those both, I think, from a evidence base on how you actually reduce stigma, which Dr. Barry had, had, had referenced, but also what movements did in practice to actually create momentum. Um, uh, and, and we reviewed hundreds of publications, interviewed dozens of experts, and I'll you know, very quickly uh, go through some of our key findings and how that generated into our plan. But, but Clearly, you know, there's a lot more here. And so if you're interested in having a conversation, please reach out. Next slide. Uh, 
So other folks have touched on this today, and, and, and I know it will be a topic, but we really identified public stigma, structural stigma, and self-stigma as things that we had to be aware of when thinking about and having a nuanced response to addressing stigma. But really importantly, and, and this has been brought up in the previous presentations, uh, the opioid crisis is uniquely facing this sort of fourth form of stigma against medications for opioid use disorder. And these are certainly, that stigma is certainly weaved throughout public, structural, and self, um, but, but it's clear that many in the community uh, believe that this is something that uh, where you're treating, you know, quote, one addiction for another, and, and that type of um, uh, stigma certainly has a, a, a significantly detrimental effect, given what we know about the effectiveness of those medications. Next slide. I want to touch on this really briefly, um, just because this was something that was, was really evident from a lot of what we learned from other social change movements, which is that if you are looking at a stigma against OUD within a, within a vacuum, and you're not understanding how those things layer on top of other forms of racism, discrimination, bias, many more that are, that are on this PowerPoint page, um, you're not really doing justice to, to a lot of folks uh, that, that need the support and the help, um, and you're just not creating sound uh, policy and response if you're not kind of considering and thinking about how to weave these in. Next slide. I'm going to spend a little bit more time here because I think this is really the culmination of a lot of our a lot of our work and the research. Um, we boiled down dozens of success factors that we had heard from our from our many expert interviews and publications, and really tried to combine them into a digestible set of factors that we saw in most, if not all, movements. And like I said previously, this is a combination of you know mechanisms that actually are proven to reduce stigma, but also how you in practice create a, a movement. So. Um, certainly having a well-funded central actor or set of coordinated actors can benefit the creation of rapid change with those working together. I think points two and three really dovetail nicely with, with what Dr. Barry outlined and, and certainly a lot of her and her team's research is well incorporated into this. Um, it's not just about education. It's not just about language. It, it, you have to get really into the details of how you're doing that education, the messages that you're sending. And if you're not taking that kind of very um, uh, surgical approach to, to education, you're not going to achieve the types of results that you want. For more practical basis, uh, you know, points four through six talk, you know, we're really learning about how movements created change. So activating influential institutions first, employing positive and negative incentives to create a stakeholder behavior and get people to get engaged and actually do the, the stigma intervention. And then also that Action was mobilized both at the grass tops, right? So it was senior people, people um, very invested in this issue, but also local communities and grassroots efforts. Next slide. Next slide. So, so at a high level, uh, we identified multiple stakeholder systems that needed to be addressed. I think one thing we learned is that it, taking a one size fits all approach is certainly not going to be effective and that the type of stigma that individuals are feeling from their providers is very different than what they're feeling from their employers. And I think our ambassadors actually really touched on this nicely explaining sort of the nuances that, uh, you know, what they're hearing from their providers and what they're feeling from their family members. Uh, next slide. So within all of these uh, stakeholder groups, we think there's a sim simple standardized set of actions that can be taken. Many of these deeply rooted in the success factors that we had outlined earlier, um, whether it be sharing stories, language, changing policy, and Shatterproof has been working diligently over the past six to 12 months and, and will continue to do so over the coming year to build off the shelf content, wraparound tools, things that are easily um, able to be implemented and, and items that we hope to give to organizations to implement and, and to Dr. Barry's point, things that we hope to study, right? I mean, there's a lot more that needs to be evaluated on top of this, but we believe there's a, a standardized set of tools that can at least be implemented today that will likely, very likely reduce stigma and certainly is worth sort of evaluating around. Next slide. We know very clearly from the evidence that if Shatterproof were to do this alone, it wouldn't be nearly as effective if, if, as if we got many other institutions involved. So we've, we're beginning to work with partners who we know we need dozens of to scale and fund this effort, the tens of thousands of allies who actually need to implement the action items and, and do the actions that are stigma reducing, and the dozens, if not hundreds of coalition members that we need to partner alongside with actually bring in more partners and allies to achieve 
uh, a significant level of change. Next slide. So at a high level, we're hoping to launch in Q1 of 2021, but between now and then, we'll be doing a lot of work uh, to really uh, create that coalition, that broad coalition of partners and allies, and, and continue talking about the importance of stigma and how it relates to the opioid epidemic, especially in the time of, of COVID with, with the, the shame and social isolation that's, that's around today. The ultimate goal being that we can achieve some tipping point uh, for mass adoption, similar to what we've seen in other social movements that have made you know, significant strides like marriage equality or HIV AIDS. Uh, next slide. Just wanna thank everyone again for, for taking the time and the space. Please reach out. Uh, we have a, a multitude of resources and, and are certainly able to provide a lot more depth um, to the plan and the resources available. So uh, the email's here and um, happy to send uh, you know, more detailed slides as well. Thank you. Thank you again, Matthew, for that overview. I know that uh, you can get very granular into the plan that Shatterproof has. Uh, I would encourage folks to, to go to the website and uh, take a look at what's really involved um, in their plan. And I'm sure we'll have some opportunity to, to dive in a little bit more uh, during this uh, particular town hall. Um, before I go to uh, Joy Rucker, I would just like to encourage people, if you're having questions, if you're having comments, if you have things that you'd like to, to hear addressed, please uh, just enter them in, in the Q&A section on the webinar and the, that will come up to us. So at this point, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Joy Rucker from the uh, Texas Harm Reduction Coalition to, to give us that sort of boots on the ground uh, approach and what uh, stigma there is. And there's huge stigma in the harm reduction field, uh, put upon the harm reduction field. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you to both uh, Megan and Marcy for sharing your stories. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's very touching. Um, so it's the Texas Harm Reduction Alliance, not coalition. It's okay. Um, we get confused a lot. Next slide, please. So I really uh, wanted to talk, uh, give a definition of stigma because I think we talk about it and we don't really look at what it it actually means and take it in and it's undes undesired differences to be stig stigmatized is to be is to hold contempt shunned and rendered socially invisible because of a socially disapproved status and many people have talked about this already but i think that you know we sometimes we talk about stigma and we don't really take it down to the next level on how that really impacts folks. Next slide. So other people have uh, talked about this. That's probably, you know, one of the challenges of being last is that other people are covering the same, um, same information, but I think that from a harm reduction perspective, we talk about from the, indi the individual, the family, uh, and the community. So I wanna talk about um, the individual, and people have already talked about um, some of that on their own personal experience, but what people experience is sort of like when you go to your family's house and they lock up all their va valuables, and they uh, hide their medications. And so, so within that, within your own family, you experience stigma. Um, you know, another example is non-drug related stigma is when people talk loud to blind people, you know, or not wanting to touch people who are disabled or ill. Next slide. And stigma uh, in terms of institutions, you know, it really does come out to how, uh, how it's translated into public policy, practice, and funding decisions. So while I'm, in, I'm grateful that there's uh, quite a bit of money coming out uh, to address the opioid uh, crisis, 
people have been overdosing for years and it hasn't it's only become a crisis in the last few years when um, young white teenagers um, have been identified as overdosing and that all of a sudden there's a ton of money that is flowing through um, our country. And I don't say that to say that um, it's a bad thing. It's just part of what we, what happens with stigma if you don't look at all the, all the factors in it. Next slide. So stigma also is internalized, um, where people and people have talked about that already, um, how you feel about yourself and the shame that you feel when you're struggling with a problem and you know if you go, go and get help, what the, what the attitude is going to be on the other side of the table. And it's very discouraging and you're already struggling with something you have no idea how to manage. Next slide. Stigma by association. So I want to, you know, what we experience in the harm reduction field is um, people will assume because you work in harm reduction that you are currently using drugs. And I was at a meeting one time at a high level meeting and, um, and this one director said, I know that there's people in this room that are high. And, you know, and I was like, well, I, you know, like I'm wondering who that person is because uh, all of the harm reduction representatives, we were all drug free. We were all living in recovery. So the assumption that uh, by association creates stigma as well. Next slide. Um, of course, we've talked about language and how you can change that. I think it's very important. Uh, words are very powerful and we, um, and we really have to take the time to understand how they can impact people. As a uh, person with lived experience, I remember every single encounter that was negative with the medical profession based on their words. Next, next slide. Racism plays a huge part of uh, stigma. All of these factors come to bear in how people have a perception of people that use drugs. So you cannot just look at the drug user without looking at all the other institutionalized factors that create stigma and race is one of them. Next slide. So we can see this in the mandatory minimum sentence, how um, in the crack e epidemic, that there were harsher sentences for crack and they were and crack was mostly used by people of color compared to uh, coke snorting users who had much more um, amounts of cocaine and got less sentences instead of a small gram uh, a few five grams of crack were sentenced to five years in uh, federal prison. So that, again, is a, a stigma when people look at that and that's what gets perpetuated to us in the news. Next slide. Economics, people talked about uh, this. It impacts a person's, uh, person's available resources for insurance, access to services and housing. All of that, if, you could, if I go into my doctor and because I have insurance, because I have a job, because I'm housed, I'm going to be treated differently than someone who shows up that doesn't have housing, that doesn't have insurance, or who is unemployed. Next slide. Poverty, again, uh, it's a 
the impact, if you look at it uh, in terms of like the HIV continuum of care and how African Americans were impacted by that, and the, and we have less um, worse outcomes on the continuum of care and lower rates of linkages to care. And it's the same thing within this epidemic around uh, opioid use. There are more people that are marginalized because they don't have the access or resources to the kinds of treatments that are available. Next slide. And then for my final slide, you know, I really think it's, uh, what are your personal beliefs about people who use drugs? Do you have biases on the types of drugs and method of use? Oops, sorry. Um, do you believe drug use is a disease or a moral failing? So I always, you know, in my work, I think that we can talk about stigma and we can come up with uh, recommendations about language and look at systems. But the bottom line comes, it comes down to what is your personal belief and how do you, how do you see the people that come in that you're, you're supposed to be treating you? And I know from my own lived experience that when I, when I was actively using, I was treated very differently than when I had a job and insurance and I showed up with, um, I showed up in a much more presentable manner than, um, than when I was actively using. And so for me, it's really, we have to ask people that are treating other people with addiction issues. It's really, what, how do you see these people that come into your office? And what is your belief around them? So that is my last slide because I feel like that that really is the personal part of what drives us. We can make recommendations, but people really have to uh, internalize, look at themselves and ask themselves, you know, how do I really feel about the people that I'm serving? Thank you. Thank you, that was very well put. I, I appreciate your comments very much. Um, and I'd like to stay on them actually as we as we start out this discussion. Just a piece of information first: um, the uh, this uh, this town hall is being recorded and will be available uh, later for people to uh, watch again. And all of the slide decks will also be available. And uh, actually, I want to take a minute and commend the speakers for getting through very robust slide decks in a very uh, short period of time and just making all of that information, however, available to people to go back and digest later when the decks are available. So, so uh, just that information, the decks and this recording will be available. I'd like to go back to um, something that Joy had said just very recently, which is around language and that language is very, very powerful. Um, and uh, you, you put up a, a, a list of uh, some of the common problems we have with language, dirty drug screens and addict and et cetera. Um, just during the course of, of today, um, I've heard two, there are two uh, terms that just are, are really important to me that are, uh, that I wanted to throw out. And what I would like to do is to ask each of you for your one or two terms or, or constructs that you think are really stigmatizing and really uh, just bother you and you would like to have addressed. Uh, because until we get our language discussions to understand underlying constructs, we're not going to particularly get anywhere here. So, so the first thing, uh, Joy, you said uh, that you were living in recovery. Um, and I often hear people say that uh, people have recovered. And as you mentioned, this is a chronic brain disease and you don't recover from chronic diseases. You get into recovery, which means you're living your best life. You're managing your, your, you know, your condition. Um, you don't recover from Parkinson's, uh, but you're in recovery. And for doctors, we aim for remission where people have no signs or symptoms of disease, but being recovered gives this acute care construct that's really at our odds 
and I think is stigmatizing because of that, because it blames people as though they had recovered and now somehow they've managed to get this disease, not to get a disease, but to, to mess up again. So that language that you used is really important, I think, about uh, working uh, or being in the process of recovery. And the second thing, uh, uh, term I heard, and I heard it in the right contract text with, um, with uh, quotes around it, was the term of graduating from a treatment program. You don't graduate from an inpatient stay because your diabetes was out of control. You don't graduate from a cardiac you know, care. You don't graduate from treating your Parkinson's in a more intensive, you know, that's, it's an episode of care during doing a location, but that graduation concept, again, is stigmatizing, I think, that, that uh, it gives some impression that people are all fixed now. And, you know, when they use again, they messed up because they had been fixed. So those two pieces of language, I think, are really stigmatizing and aren't often included in lists of, of stigmatizing language. But I'm wondering for each of you, what, what pieces of language and constructs do you find really stigmatizing in ways people might not have typically thought of or might typically think of, but they're just really impressive to you? So you've already mentioned one that um, just bothers me. I'm not quite sure why it does, but it does. <clears throat> the, the terminology around drug screens where they're, it's dr clean or dirty, somehow it's something I keep addressing over and over again. I try really, really hard to make sure I'm doing it differently and I, it's frustrating. Um, that's just a pet peeve. Okay. The, Joy, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No. Continue? Oh, please go ahead. Joy, I thought you were going to say something. Sure. Um, I guess mine is, uh, how we define recovery. Um, you know, people often think recovery is strictly abstinence based. And I, know, I think people define their own recovery, um, whether I'm on medicated assisted treatment or, um, or I'm completely abstinent. I think that we make the assumption that recovering is only about abstinence based. And I'd like, I'd like to be able to add to that recovery is based on a person's definition of what what they are changing in the and what's the quality of their life it might not have anything to do with stop using drugs so i'm going to weigh in here maybe if that's okay kelly absolutely um, uh, i want to i guess first to make the point um and i alluded to this before but i want to say it clearly that we have rigorously done research evidence that um, clearly shows that use of words like addict um, and substance ab abuse um, increase stigma uh, relative to a control arm where more person-centered language is used. So these terms have been shown to drive up stigma. So we need to eliminate them from our vo vocabulary if we want to change people's attitudes. <clears throat> I think um, for me, one area that I've been thinking a lot about and um, talking a lot about is the language around uh, opiate agonists and medications uh, more generally. Um, and I think words like substitution and replacement therapy are, are just not helpful in conveying the role of the life-saving role of, of, of medications for opiate use disorder. And I think one sort of um, rule of thumb for me is if we use different language or different approaches related to insurance design, for example, in an addiction context, relative to what we do in other areas of medicine. If there's not a clear reason to do so, then my intuition is it's driven by stigma. Um, and so I think that we really need to think about integrating um, care for uh, addiction in a, in a much more central way and then language and stigma flow from that. Um, I think the last thing I'll say about how we think about medication is, I know this, the term um, 
Uh, Medication-assisted treatment, MAT, is um, very commonly used in the field. Um, my only sort of small quibble with that language is these are um, life-saving medications that are gold standard with um, large evidence bases, and they're they're not really assisting anything. Um, and to my point a minute ago, minute ago um, in other areas of medicine, we don't use this medication-assisted term to refer to medication. So I would love for us to move to the point where we refer to these medications as medications for opiate use disorder as opposed to medication-assisted treatment. I know that that's um, something that might take some time, but that would be uh, an aspiration that I would have. Yeah. Great, Colleen. I, I would add to that just that uh, ASAM does not use the term, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, the Addiction Physicians of America, does not use the term medication-assisted treatment uh, at this point for the reasons that you said. Uh, some people I know when they say MAT, they clarify it to, to mean medication for addiction treatment. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine's document was asked to put out a document about medication-assisted treatment, and as you know, uh, that document uh, basically refused to utilize that language and uses medication-based treatment in instead, uh, and also the medication for opiate use disorder are all pieces of language that are uh, being used now rather than the stigmatizing construct that somehow, you know, insulin assists the treatment of, of, of diabetes and medications assist the treatment of addictive disease. So, so well put. Matthew, do you have anything you'd yeah. like to add in there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll sort of copy and echo Dr. Barry. I mean, I think we, we actually had to ask ourselves the same question of what are the one or two that, that might be a priority, because as we think about transitioning, you know, dozens of words into practical, you know, types of tools that organizations can use, we're creating, you know, short videos and, and really having to center in on a few that we think are especially important. And I think um, the evidence uh, that Dr. Barry was referring to around addict and abuse were especially important for us to raise in terms of how much evidence there is around those specific terms. So those are the ones that were really dedicated to getting widespread sort of removal of, um, with, with the one caveat being, I think, and I'm sure others on this call can speak to this better than I can, that, um, you know, there's still a lot to know about sort of the reclaiming of language and, 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 and whether or not those who are in recovery or active addiction and, and how they use words different than sort of the general public or providers and so on and so forth. So, I mean, that's certainly our, our approach with these words is, is uh, you know, a lot more research to understand which are stigmatizing, you know, centered in on a few that we know are stigmatizing and really focusing those efforts on the public providers, people who would sort of use stigmatizing words against others, but not necessarily within the, the communities themselves for that, that reason uh, that I stated earlier. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of go back to, um, gee, those two slides, uh, Margaret, that you showed about uh, low familiarity uh, with people with substance use disorder or uh, or with substance use disorder in general, having not been taught about this disease state uh, and et cetera, um, that lack of familiarity is is so strongly uh, associated with, um, you know, the, a, a, a wide variety of doing things that we don't want them to do and not doing things that we do want them to do. Um, and then the issues about even when they know what to do, um, they don't adhere to some of these best practices. And some of the questions that have come up are, you know, what can medical students do? What can I do? You know, what can they? So, so those two things, and I think earlier, um, uh, our, our, our people with lived experience also from Shatterproof who spoke earlier spoke about that construct, and I'll just call it the construct of that coming out of the closet. Of, of being sort of the face of people with addictive disease so that uh, people who've got, uh, who are healthcare providers put a, a normal face. You know, this is, your, this is your preacher. This is your high school, you know, football coach. This is your et cetera. You know, we, th that's a lot to ask for, for, for people who have a stigmatizing disease, but, but what can we do to help uh, address these these two issues that you brought up, and I'd like everybody's kind of concept on this, which is how do we drive some of this change around around uh, making addictive disease taught and known by healthcare providers, and then people with addictive disease to be uh, known to their providers, as well as the how do we hold people responsible for delivering 
this evidence-based and best practice care. So I start with you, Margaret, and then I'd love to hear from everyone else on the issues. Boy, <clears throat> there's a lot we could cover there, or at <laughs> least a lot that I've seen over the last years. <clears throat> but I think one of the things that I would like to have people respond to is a phenomenon that we have seen and this is, I, while I'm talking about the Geisinger system, I can't imagine it's just Geisinger at all. Um, in fact, I know it isn't. <clears throat> but as the folks who work in our division, in the um, addiction medicine division at Geisinger, take care of pa patients who have substance use disorders, it's not an uncommon thing at all to find situations where these patients are being prescribed medications that simply are not good for them, that carry a great deal of um, addiction potential themselves. So for instance, the folks we see for whom we are prescribing buprenorphine, who are also receiving um, benzodiazepines or stimulants from other physicians. <clears throat> We see that commonly, and as we try to address that, our, our clinic practice has been that we make phone calls, we write letters, we try to get in touch with the physicians who are prescribing these other medications to say, let's collaborate on the treatment of this person and try to make sure that we both know what the other person's doing so that the patient never receives a toxic combination of medications. And while that has been a somewhat successful uh, technique within the Geisinger system, where we have great control over the communications and we have some ability to influence those who are in authority, as we tr deal, do this with physicians who are outside of our system, we never get phone calls back. We don't get responses to the letters. And the patients often are in a position where they are continuing to get medications that could be dangerous for them. And so to your point, Kelly, there's a piece of needing to develop some, um, some standards and some body of a authoritative body that's willing to take a stance and say, this is not good practice and something needs to change here. Um, and like I said, within our system, the system does that. But beyond that, there's not a boatload of oversight. And perhaps there's, there might be a way someday of being able to do that. Uh, and I think that could make a big difference in how well people are helped to be. So the answer is a hammer. Uh, usually <laughs> so the hammer of yeah. who, who is the state licensing board for the individuals to require uh, appropriate kinds of care. Okay, other answers? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a, a few things that, that we're doing at Shatterproof or seeing, and I'm, I'm actually excited to hear from uh, Richard Botner, who I know is going to be speaking on the next panel, who, who's speaking a little bit to the um, education piece, but actually getting in front of providers in a, in a, in a big way um, from a continuing education standpoint around OUD stigma and, and the language to use and all these sorts of things. But I think it's important to also work, you know, more upstream. And I know that, you know, sort of outside of the stigma initiative, um, Shatterproof and, and many others are, are pushing and advocating for more education on these topics earlier on in the context of medical schools and elsewhere um, uh, to, to really get that training, those stories, all those sorts of things happening earlier so that people are coming into practice with that sort of knowledge. And then I think, you know, the final piece here, which I think you touched on is this concept of stories. And, and I know that uh, in narrative and, and Dr. Barry has done a lot of research on this, so I'll leave mo most of it to her, but um, certainly from an implementation standpoint, 
um, collecting stories, a diverse range that uh, represent a lot of different people who, like you said, it's your preacher, it's your brother, it's your, you know, teacher, and, and being able to bring all of that to light in that sort of, um, in those stories and, and making sure that those stories are really customized and speak to the people that they're being delivered to is really important. So um, that's a big component of, of what we're working on and building a, a large library of stories of those in recovery and, and using all the, the great kind of evidence base um, around what kind of prompts and messages those people need to uh, communicate in their stories to actually have a, a stigma reduction effect with providers and others. So just to chime in, thank you so much, Matthew, for, for those points. I, I agree with them. Um, I think uh, education is critical, but we can't just focus on uh, folks that are in their training um, because there are so many uh, providers out there um, that uh, we know don't have the informa information they need. We just did a recent, um, recently published study with the Annals of Internal Medicine, and it showed very low knowledge among uh, primary care providers that effective treatments exist, um, very low interest in treating people with opiate use disorder, and very low interest in becoming wavered to prescribe buprenorphine. And so I think that it's essential that we, we change their attitudes. And one area, to, to Matthew's point, that I think really shows promise from the, the literature is conveying that treatment works in a meaningful way. I think part of the resistance we see on the part of medical providers, you know, you think of your typical um, emergency department physician who sees people coming in again and again um, who are um, experiencing an overdose, that can lead to hopelessness and providers wanna have hope. And I think that we have effective um, treatments and we just need to, in a way that is meaningful, convey those stories that are all um, out there on uh, how people have gotten into effective treatment, have, have done well, and are living productive lives. I think those kinds of stories and experiences can be transformative in uh, getting our medical community more excited about being part of uh, the treatment system and being part of the solution to the opiate crisis that this country is facing. The key word you said there, Colleen, is effective treatment. And there's been a construct that uh, many in, in, that provide treatment have that treatment works. And the truth is when we say that, we mean evidence-based treatment works. And the truth is that most of the treatment in this country does not utilize evidence-based techniques. I see Joy making that big no in her head. And so it's not that quote, any old thing that I call treatment works. It's that specific things that are evidence-based work. And the, the burnout that we see among providers is they keep sending people into the same things that we know are either not helpful or harmful. Uh, opiate use disorder going into, uh, you know, in, into some uh, place to, to be for a few weeks and come out without medications increases the risk that those people will be dead within a month than had they not do you know, gone into that kind of a, a facility. So um, I think your point there, um, you know, there's an emphasis. So I'll let you come back on that because I think you want to. Yeah, I, I do. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think this is um, an essential point. Systems need to change um, and that can be part of the pathway to reducing stigma. One, one thing that has come out of our research that's quite interesting um, is when you, when you look at um, attitudes related to mental health, we see that among friends and family members of people with a mental health disorder, that there um, is much lower stigma relative to the general population. But interestingly, we don't see that um, uh, among friends and family members of individuals with substance use disorder. And I think part of that, um, that um, what was very surprising finding to me is that loved ones of people 
struggling with addiction see them moving in and out of really ineffective treatment and they lose hope too. Um, and so I think that um, all of these pieces come together and give us a roadmap, roadmap for how to really um, tackle both systems of care and stigma at the same time. Joy? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think that we, we have this definition of what recovery is and what treatment should look like. And so when providers, medical providers don't see that immediate outcome where it's like, okay, you're now not using drugs, it, it looks like a failure to them. Um, and I think that even defining, you know, recovery um, and how the words that we use, like being a productive member of society, like what, what does that look like to the individual, not to the provider, not to my, um, to the treatment folks. It's like, what does that look like for me? And um, I, I just think that we, we are so locked into a traditional way of thinking that it just makes it hard for people to break out of that, that paradigm, you know, to think differently. It's like, what does, uh, what does treatment look like for me? And, you know, in harm reduction, we use the phrase, any, cha any positive change, any small change is positive. So if today I'm eating out of a, a dumpster, and tomorrow I'm in the food line getting food from a shelter, that's a positive change. And we don't, we, people have different values in how they judge what that change looks like. But I Thank do you. think, I do think it is important for providers to reframe what success looks like to them too. Because if we only focus on um, changing our notions on the part of individuals, then I think stigmatizing views in the health profession, like we heard about at the beginning of the session, will continue. We need to redesign, redefine success um, in all of the uh, communities and settings in which individuals are living and um, moving through a process of uh, recovery. Yeah, well, we have two point. minutes. Sorry, we've got two minutes left here. Um, just having looked through the questions, um, just a few more things to let uh, folks participating in this um, uh, know. Uh, there was been some questions about COVID-19 and access to uh, addiction treatment. Uh, as uh, Victor said earlier, the National Academy of Medicine and the um, American Society of Addiction Medicine are doing some webinars on addiction uh, during COVID-19. And there, there actually is one on this topic tomorrow. I believe Dr. Jarvis will be part of that uh, discussion as well. So I'd encourage people with the, the COVID questions to uh, check that out as well as the uh, recordings of prior ones. Um, you know, there's been some, uh, I'll just say there's been a number of uh, discussions, uh, uh, questions coming in about making that paradigm change among uh, the traditional 12-step uh, peer support groups uh, in the, that construct. I just wanted to call out where a lot of the questions have been around here. Some questions around uh, payment structures so that we can more fully integrate addiction medicine as a specialty um, and caring for this, uh, this disease state into the medical system. And uh, so those things have been uh, through too. If I can get, let you each have, because we're at 1029, 10 seconds for the, you know, the one thing you would like people to take away from this. Um, I'd love, love to let you have those 10 seconds now. So I'll go down the line that I can see you at. So Dr. Jarvis and then uh, Dr. Barry, uh, Ms. Rucker and Mr. Stefan. All right, so the issue with the, um, uh, the insurance payments, it, there's, it, there's stigma there too. And so we've been talking about value-based payments for forever. And it's taking an extraordinarily long time to see okay. that be realized. 
it would make life so much easier for everybody concerned um, if we actually saw that adopted, but it is slow and there's a lot of talk and a limited amount of action. Okay, 10 seconds, Colleen. Yeah, I think in the context of COVID-19, all of these issues become so much more difficult um, because folks are more vulnerable. They're not getting access to the services they need, both treatment services, but also harm reduction services. So uh, we need to keep the um, drug crisis foremost in our mind as we think about how it interacts with the pandemic. Thank you, Joy. I think um, what we're experiencing here in, in Austin is there is a lot of focus on uh, people that are unhoused in this uh, epidemic. And without the understanding, there's a subculture of homeless people that use drugs and there's not been any, um, any kind of system to address that. Um, understanding like you cannot just isolate people in a shelter and then expect them not to go out and use. So I think that, you know, there's always this subculture that we don't think about and nor do we create options for. All right, great. Thank you. And Matthew, 10 seconds. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's that this is, this is doable that there is a growing evidence base and that every organization has a big role to play in addressing stigma and that there are actions that everyone can take. And, and hopefully that, you know, depending on the organization, um, uh, you could figure out what those are, uh, but recognize that it's, you know, more important now to do that um, than, than before. All right, well, thank you to all the panelists. We're at 1032. And so I'd like to let, hand this back to the National Academy with apologies for being two minutes over. Not at all, we're, we're in fine time. Thank you all so much for your terrific presentations and, and great discussion. We will now take a short break and we will return with session two at 10.50 a.m. Eastern. Thank you. <laughs>